This is Overcoming Performance Christianity, the podcast that leads you on a path to freedom in your walk with Christ. If you're a longtime Christian, but something's missing in your relationship with God, then you might be caught up in performing for the Lord. Find out more as we dive into this episode of Overcoming Performance Christianity. I'm John Fugler, on the road from performance to relationship in my walk with Christ, so I'm taking you with me helping you gain freedom from the bondage of performance Christianity. This podcast does that as well as the devotional series I wrote called Your Life with God. I'm a longtime Christian media guy, a husband, father, grandfather of nine, also the CEO of Fresh Faith 24-7. That's where we lead you on a path to freedom from the bondage of performance Christianity. And I ask you this, are you ready to get to know Jesus? To know Jesus. Paul said, what's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And that's what we're all about here at Fresh Faith 24-7 and on this podcast, Overcoming Performance Christianity. Well, I just passed a milestone 50 years ago, this past Saturday, that's when I came to know Christ. (laughs) For the first time, I had heard the gospel clearly And I went forward in a small church on a cold winter night in upstate New York and gave my life to Christ. I was born again. And the guy who led me to Christ, he was a speaker who was a football coach. That's why I went there, to hear him talk about football. He didn't. He talked about how to be born again, Uh, talked through John 3 and Nicodemus and what it meant to be born again. And that night, I was born again. So 50 years ago, whew a half a century. And man, do I have this Christian life down. (laughs) Eh, No, uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh. You would think I would by now, but I don't. (laughs) And uh, so I admit that as we go through uh, the things that we do on this podcast, and we talk about what it means to escape from performance Christianity, which I was in bondage in for so many years, I want you to know that, that you're in good company. And we're escaping together, and we're getting on the right path to freedom. And I, I, I love that you're here. So thank you so much. And I, I share with some guests with you that are in that journey too, uh, some further along than others. And uh, our guest on this show is no different. But this whole thing of performance Christianity and gaining freedom from that, uh, what does that look like in real life? How does it play out? And I like to look at the 11 big promises, and I've shared these before, and think about these. Don't you want all these in your life? If you're a performer for Christ and not in deep relationship with him, not living in freedom, but don't you want these things in freedom? And and here are the big promises. Freedom leads to fruit. And I'm talking about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, et cetera. We all want to experience that. And this freedom from the bondage of performance Christianity leads to fruit. We don't stop obeying God. But the second thing, the second big promise is that we obey God with joy. Our heart's in it because we love him. And we're joyful as we obey Jesus. The third big promise is the pressure to perform is removed. It's gone. We don't, we don't sense and feel that pressure, that self-imposed pressure to perform. It is gone. It's removed. Isn't that fantastic? Don't you want that, like a weight off your shoulder? The fourth big promise of how freedom from performance Christianity plays out in real life is that we don't feel self-imposed guilt because we aren't earning God's approval. That's freedom. The fifth thing is we realize that Jesus is walking with us and not looking over our shoulder. We may have gone through years and years of thinking, man, I got to do the right things for God. Jesus is looking over my shoulder. He's checking it out. And no, it's not that way. But picture Jesus walking side by side with you and not looking over your shoulder. And that leads to the sixth big promise, which is similar to number five. And that is we have confidence that we're walking with Christ walking with Christ. That's beautiful. The seventh big promise of walking in freedom from the bondage of performance Christianity is victory over sin because we aren't fighting in our own power. See, this performance thing says 
that we're doing it ourselves, that we've got, we're mature in Christ, so we need to act like a Christian and do the obedience thing, follow Christ, which we should. But when we're walking in our own power, it, 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 we sin. We don't have victory when we're, when we're fighting in our own power. So freedom leads to victory over sin. Number eight, we realize that God is our friend. He doesn't stop being Lord. He doesn't stop being king, but he is our friend. He always has been if we know Jesus, but the light goes on when we're walking in freedom. And that is God is our friend. Uh, The ninth big promise is we understand and experience God's love more. We understand it. We experience it. It's beautiful. We know it. And we internalize it. We have this love relationship with God. The tenth big promise when we're walking in freedom from the bondage of performance Christianity is that we will glorify God. It's just going to happen. It's an outgrowth of it. And, and what a thrill to glorify God, not because we're, we're churning and trying so hard, but we're living in freedom. And we do it with joy. And then finally, the eleventh big promise is that we will please God. Isn't that what we wanted to do in the first place when we're performing for the Lord? We want to please him. (laughs) But it's all different when you're walking in freedom. We're pleasing God as a result of our relationship with him, not to earn his approval and earn his love, but we'll please him just because we're walking in relationship with him in freedom. And that itself is freeing and fun. I hadn't planned on sharing these things, but once I I looked at these, I got them taped up on the wall right next to me here in my studio. And I I looked over and I said, we we need to talk about these things. And I started going through these and I get really excited when I do. I'll put these in the show notes, okay, so you can have those. And uh, so let's get back on track here as if we, we weren't. Uh, this is the, the podcast for high-performing Christians, in case you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> um, and uh, I always start with a question, and this is the one I bring to you this week, is do you consider yourself a person who has a strong faith? Or is it shaky? Is it strong or is it shaky? It's a trick question because if you're like me, Uh, You're in both camps. I'm in both camps, depending on the situation. And the guest I want you to meet in this episode lives consistent faith. And I can't wait for you to hear his story. And he'll be our featured guest coming up because we like to bring this concept of freedom and fresh faith to life. And it happens when you hear from our guests. But before we hear from him, let's, let's talk about for a minute what causes us to go into performance mode in our relationship with Christ? Why is it that we don't experience fully these 11 big promises of freedom? Um, And the answer is this, because we're talking about faith in in this episode, we we stop walking by faith and we start walking by works. It's that simple. I think it's a lot like Peter. Remember Peter when he got out of the boat, walked on water straight towards Jesus. He saw Jesus, his Messiah, Uh, Son of God, Son of Man, and he was confident in Christ. Then, uh uh-oh, he realized he was walking on water. And man does not do that. (laughs) So down he went. And we get that way, don't we? And I think it's because we don't really know the full character of Jesus. Peter got a glimpse of it, and then for some reason just slipped away. Well, walking on water, that fear probably did it. But we don't really know the full character of Jesus. And so we walk by works. We say we know Jesus, but the way we live shows us that we don't know him as well as we thought we did. So that's, that's an issue. Let's, let's walk by faith, not by works. And that's really what gets us out of the freedom mode into bondage once again. In this episode... I want to introduce you to an important principle, and it's, it's knowing the Christ of the cross. I believe that is a, just a central point, and it's something we need to understand that will also lead you into this, this freedom and keep you on that path to freedom, knowing the Christ of the cross. So 
we'll, we'll talk about that. And we'll hear from our guest, too, as he lives out his faith. But before we do those things, I want to make sure you download your free spiritual self-assessment because it's good to know where we stand in our relationship with God. Is it healthy? How healthy? So I developed a spiritual self-assessment that will give you some answers. Thank you for those who have gone ahead and downloaded it and you've taken it. Hopefully it has been helpful for you. If you haven't downloaded it yet, go get it. It just takes about three minutes to go through this. Include some probing questions after you go through the initial part that will give you the honest truth about your relationship with Christ. Uh, Go get that assessment now. You can take it in secret. You don't have to tell anybody what the answers are. But uh, And it's free, of course, when you go to my website at freshfaith247.com. Freshfaith247.com, or just click the link in the show notes. That's a resource I want to make available to you. We'll talk more about resources as we go along here. When I tell friends, we're, we're getting into our, our main segment here, okay? So knowing the Christ of the cross is where we're going now. This is huge. This is this is big. I'm writing a book right now about uh, escaping the bondage of performance Christianity. And the chapter on knowing the Christ of the cross, that is real central in the whole process. When I tell friends that I want to help people know the Christ of the cross, they picture Jesus hanging there on the cross. And indeed, the cross is central to coming to know Jesus but it's not the whole story of who he is. Jesus is eternal, and I want to know him in all his everlasting existence. I was interviewed on a couple podcasts that just uh, released uh, last week. I'll put a link to them in the show notes. Uh, One of them, I believe it's called Living a Legacy with Sue Donaldson. She hosts that, and then the True Man podcast. And you can go ahead and listen to those because I talk about this. I talk about knowing the Christ of the cross in detail. John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. This tells us that Jesus is the word and was there in the beginning. And John clarifies it in verse 14 when he says later in the passage, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So you can really read through this and lose the significance and and the richness of the words that describe Christ. So here are those words that describe Christ. I mean, if you have your Bible, if you're not driving or running or whatever, um, go to John 1. That's where we are right now, or check it out later. But here are all the rich words that, that describe Christ. One is the word. Uh, Second is, all things were made through him. He is the ultimate creator. Life, uh, light. Think about these things. Life, light. He dwelled among us. Uh, Another word that describes Christ is glory, grace, and truth. That, that's all, I believe, in, in verse 14, John 1, 14. Well, John 1, 3 through 5 and verse 14. All these things that describe Christ. And we could spend years diving into the depths of all these qualities of Jesus. Just these, and these are just a few. Imagine getting to know his glory. <laughs> Woo, that would take a few weeks, <laughs> months, years. <laughs> Imagine getting to know his truth. How about his grace? You might need the grace of Jesus right now where you just, you're going through things in your life and you need his grace. He is a God of grace and you get to know his grace. Um, There's no finish line to getting to know Christ. No finish line at all. We go deeper, discovering afresh 
the amazing Jesus that we we have come to know. 50 years ago, I came to know Christ. And that was just the beginning. And, and yet, I really didn't know him. <laughs> and I won't know him like I will know him if I'm still around in 10 years. Because as I pursue him and get to know him, I really know him. All these things about Jesus and his character, and those are just, that's just a glimpse. All throughout the scripture, we learn about Jesus. Jesus hung on the cross, and we should never lose sight of that. We talk about uh, knowing the Christ on the cross. That is important. Thanks to his sacrifice, we have that privilege of knowing him and knowing his Father. And without the cross, there'd be no relationship at all. With the cross, we have a starting point in our relationship. This is going to extend to all eternity. I'm excited as I talk about this, if you can tell. And um, the concept of knowing Christ in all his fullness and eternal being is phenomenal. There's power, fulfillment, joy. Uh, It's a lifelong experience. It won't end on earth. We get to continue the journey even more fully in heaven. I'm supercharged about that. (laughs) Oh, Jesus of the cross. Not just a point in time on the cross, but of the cross that is eternal. No beginning and no end. Who is this Jesus? (laughs) I ask myself that. And it's mind-boggling as I think about it and I pray, Lord Jesus, reveal yourself to me. Now, why, the questions I ask are like, why did he die for us? Why does he want to know me and why does he want me to know him? What was he thinking on that day he created man? <laughs> Those are just a few questions that come to my mind. And when I get to meet him, I'm probably going to get the answers a lot more fully than, than I do on this side of heaven. Then I dash forward to John's words in Revelation, describing the Christ of the cross. And see, here's some of the highlights from Revelation 1, verses 12 through 18. I've taken the liberty to kind of list these for you so it's clear. And here's here's how it starts. Here's how John starts. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was... And here's the list I want to read to you of who this Christ of the cross is. Uh, Earlier, we went through some things about the Christ of the cross, light, life, truth, etc. But here are some things now that John sees in Revelation. Someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. What a description. The hair on his head, was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. This is coming to a crescendo here, isn't it? Coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And he goes on to say, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. Now that is a far cry from the Jesus we picture on the cross. Look at the vivid words John uses to describe our beloved Savior in all his power and glory. Don't you get chills when, you're, when you read these verses, when you hear this, this list I share with you? Go read those verses. Revelation 1, verses 12 through 18. Oh, This is what I mean when I say that I want to know the Jesus of the cross. I want to know all of him for all time. The cross is the dividing point between death and life. Jesus moving from the weak man we observe in overwhelming pain on the cross to the almighty God John portrays here that he describes so well. John's words describing Jesus are really inadequate, but they're stunning still. 
Jesus' declaration to John on that, that mighty climax where he says, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. John was in fear as he was, as he was dreaming this. And, and Jesus said, don't be afraid, <laughs> before he said, I'm the first and the last. Oh, how I want to know Jesus in all his fullness, from the beginning of creation, through revelation, all the way into eternity. Remember Paul's words in Philippians 3.10, where he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. He wanted to know all of Jesus. And at the time, he didn't know the fullness of Jesus described in John's revelation. God had amazing things in store for Paul once he met his Savior face to face. Ah, wouldn't you like to have been there? First reaction? <laughs> uh, we'll probably have the same one, right? To know Christ in his eternity is to know him fully. Absolutely fully. From the eternal beginning to the eternal end of time and every minute in between. It's the most thrilling adventure known to man. And you have an awesome privilege to enter into a personal, lasting, loving relationship with the God of the universe. Jesus of eternity. Oh my. You know, one of the, the series of 15 video devotionals I shot inside Fresh Faith 24-7 focus on the identities and character qualities of Jesus. I go into more detail, um, bringing in scripture, making you think. And if you want to know the Christ of the cross, I recommend you just go to freshfaith247.com. Uh, start your free trial of membership and check them out. Um, you go in and just explore, go through those devotionals and just have at it, okay, at freshfaith247.com. I got to take a breath here. I have not done any editing on this. What you're hearing is I just turned this recording on and we're, we're doing it. So you're hearing what I'm thinking, what I'm, maybe you're hearing what I'm thinking, but anyway, we're just going for it here. And I, I hope you sense my enthusiasm, my heart for this. And I do. I pray that you will escape the bondage of performance Christianity and live in freedom in your walk with Christ. My guest on this episode is the epitome of faith lived out. The more I talked to him, the more I realized that. As I talked with Tom Fay, I was so impressed that in his decades of service for the Lord, he's been able to keep performance Christianity outside the door of his life. And I asked him point blank about this and yeah, he's able to do that. So I was trying to figure out why. How was he able to do that? And as you hear his story, you'll understand why, as I did. He, he walks by faith, even in seasons when God is silent. Tom is a former pastor. He's a church planter. He's also an entrepreneur. Uh, he's an author, and I just finished his latest book, which is really good. And we talk about that in the interview, so I won't spoil it here. I won't say anything more. So let's go right into it. Let's meet Tom Fay. Oh man, uh, people can't see it, but I'm looking at you and in the background is the, the beautiful harbor in San Diego and there's yachts behind you. And I know that's not real because you're at home right now, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but you are in San Diego. That's true. That's true. And I do have some great sailing stories too. Oh, oh, that's good. That's, that's for another good. interview, probably. Is is one of your uh, yachts the behind uh, you there over your shoulder? No, no. no. <laughs> okay. The, the key word that we're going to focus on in this episode is, is the word faith. Uh, such an ordinary word, but when I speak it, it's like exhaling. Uh, maybe our listeners can try just faith. And it's relaxing when you say that. And I know God's taken you through an adventure of faith over the years, and especially lately. You know, as we uh, think about this whole idea of uh, performing for Christ, and I mean, you were a pastor for, for many years. Did you ever get wrapped up in this whole performance thing? Oh, so totally. And I have to, uh, I have to confess that when I uh, was out of the ministry and was going to school, uh, I went back to school when I was 30. 
um, I felt that God didn't love me anymore because I wasn't serving him. Hmm. And my identity had become so tied up with being pastor. And I think about all of these people who are pastors and how during their lifetime, they become so identified with what they do and, and their performance, you know, and they miss out on, on really understanding God, his love, his mercy, and, and that he loves us unconditionally. Did you realize that when you were uh, in the pastorate or did it hit afterwards? No way. No way. It was afterward. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Tell me how that unfolded. Well, it was just, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, I was very wrapped up in the ministry and, and from a worldly standpoint, some would say quite successful at it, but and so you become thinking, you know, well, well, gee, I'm doing all this for God, you know, and he must love me because of that. Mm. And and that becomes your identity. I mean, I was Tom Fay pastor. Mm. And uh, rather than Tom Fay sinner saved by grace or Tom Fay child of God. Who loves uh, how were your times with the Lord uh, as you had your quiet times, devotions, your prayer times, how would you characterize them during that period? Uh, d- uh, during this change or? Yeah, bef- uh, well, as a pastor. Oh, as a pastor. Uh, I had no idea that I was having that identity. And so they were very precious to me. I mean, uh, it's kind of where I practiced faith in the beginning and, and, um, they were very special. So I can't say that, that there was anything negative. And um, I had special places in, in San Diego where I would go to pray and in kind of a private place and, and um, different things like that, you know, so. You know, I think it's the real, uh, the reality of this is if, if we're living as if we're performing for Jesus to be loved by him or accepted by him. It's not that uh, there's no fruit at all. There's not that there's no relationship all, at all. It's not a black and white thing, but we can have these moments with Christ where it's intimate, it's personal. And yeah. yet because we perform, it's our, it's our fallback. It's, it's, that is uh, we're laying a foundation of performance and at the same time able to have this, this relationship too. But, and so when you hit the, but you hit this point of uh, doubting God's love for you when you went back to school. So that, that was a crossroads for you. Tell me more Correct. about that. Yeah. I I had started a college, a Bible college in uh, San Diego. And uh, I, when I started the ministry, I was very young. I was just 23. And um, so when I started this college, I was probably about 25 or, or so 26 well, who starts a college when they're 25? <laughs> you know, <laughs> only somebody who is so stupid and young that <laughs> they don't know any better, you know. And uh, the the thing took off, and we had about 125 students, and and I came to a point where I said, "This is so far over my head," you know, that if I ever am going to serve God. I have got to go back and get more education. Hmm. And so that's what I started. And that was what I did. And I had a friend, um, maybe you have heard of him, Gene French. Have you heard that name? Uh, I think so. I think so. He was, uh, he was the founder of Youth for Christ in San Diego. He actually took over Billy Graham's position at Youth for Christ. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so he's old now. Uh, older than us, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and we're pretty young. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, so, um, uh, I had him take it over, and he did a great job. And and eventually, he brought in a friend of his who who took it over, and and uh, he did a great job. That was George Hare. And uh, in uh, the late nineties, uh, the school merged with. With another, with two other schools, and became uh, uh, Sandy, uh, Southern California Seminary. Oh, okay, okay. 
Yep. And um, so, and it's still going on, and they've got about three hundred students now. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. And you, now you're back. You're back home. Back. Back to the yeah. roots. That that's yeah. must be neat to see. Yeah, um, sure. So when you uh, then left to go back to school, that's when it hit you as far as this love relationship with Jesus. Tell tell me more about that that crossroads. Yeah, just a very very wondering. You know what uh, uh, what 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 am I here for if I'm not in the ministry? You know what's my calling? What am I doing? You know, and does God actually love me? And uh, it, it, I'll tell you exactly. I'll never forget the moment it hit me. Um, I was at Ray Stedman's church. You ever hear that name? Yep. Uh, Peninsula Bible Church. And uh, I was a friend of Ray and and um, uh, was visiting there in church. And um, they were singing a song. And, and I wish I could remember what the song was. But as we were singing it, it was it it it, it gave the impression that the words were such that he loves me no matter what. And and I was of singing that, uh, tears came to my eyes, and uh, I realized it doesn't matter what I do, he just loves me, hmm. and that was transforming in my life. Boy, and that's neat that God got a hold of you in that way. Yeah, so young. I mean, you were thirty at the time. You said, yeah. "Yes," yeah. and so I, that... I, it's like I remember the pew I was sitting in, and. and and everything, you know, but uh, I don't remember the song. Uh, I can almost, I can almost sing it, but I just can't remember what it was, but it was, it spoke to me, the words or whatever, the, the concept that was in there that, that God loves me no matter what. And that has been an unbelievable blessing throughout my life. Tell me then the contrast between the Tom Fay before that moment and the Tom Fay since then. Interesting. Um, along the way, uh, and when I when I got a degree uh, in psychology from Simpson uh, College, Simpson University, um, it's a bachelor's degree. I needed to pay off school bills and and whatever, and uh, God was not speaking to me. Now this is interesting. Hmm. Um, before when I was in the ministry and, and up to that event where I knew he loved me, I felt God was communing with me in, mm. in, in ways, whether it was just through the scripture or, or uh, through my heart or, or through my mind. Uh, but after that, uh, God went silent. And um, I really... Think it was probably one of the greatest times of my life also because it's easy to be happy when everything is going well <laughs> but what do you do when god is silent uh well i'll tell you what i did i still believed you know and i still had faith and uh, and i think that's kind of what faith is is you trust god even when you don't see him I think uh, Jesus, how long did that period go? Thirty years. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and I mean, I helped start a church. I taught Bible studies and read scriptures and and counseled people and so forth. But I didn't hear anything from God, hmm. and He didn't call me uh, to do anything other than those things that were placed in front of me. So um, you, um, wow, I'm trying to get my head around this one. Um, so you just kept walking by faith and obeyed God. Yeah. And just waiting on him, I guess, but keep going. Yeah. yeah. And uh, a lot of people, I, I, I take the illustration of Moses. Moses had three phases of his life. The middle phase was when he was in the desert for 40 years. And everybody kind of assumes that in the desert, he was communing with God, kind of like maybe Jesus communed with the Father in the desert, you know, and so on. But I take a different point of view. I think that during those 40 years, Moses didn't hear a word from God. 
There's no indication that he did. There's nothing that says he did. And yet he believed that entire time until one day when he's 80 years old, God speaks to him in a burning bush. Mm. And he was ready because he had been trusting God the whole time. Uh, I mean, he quite, he says, God, I'm not ready for this job, but <laughs> but I'm ready to bow down and take my sandals off, you know. But uh, um, uh, And so what happened with me was uh, when I was 60, I started to, to ask everybody that I came across, everybody I knew who was a Christian, I said, would you pray for me? I probably asked 20 20, 30 people, you know, and they, they all said, well, what, what's, what's your prayer request? What do you want? I said, I don't know. Just pray for me. Hmm. And pretty soon I heard God whisper and, uh, uh maybe kind of like Elijah, you know, uh, um, the still you know, small, still small voice. No small boy. You've yeah. been waiting for the rushing wind and the fire and and all that, and <laughs> it never right. came. That's right. And I and I I started talking to God, and I said, God, I'm a little upset with you. I said, all my college friends, they've been serving God their whole life, and I haven't. I want my four years of service. You know, you got to give me that, you know, that's, that was, you promised me that. So you have to give it to me. And uh, so he started leading me and I went back to seminary hmm. and got a master's degree from Fuller Seminary. And, uh, and it was there that another faith event, which <laughs> whenever you want to make that transition, we'll, we'll go into that uh, happened. In my life. Well, let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah, tell me. I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> I, I, as I was thinking about this, I have really two events that took place. One was an experiential event, and and the other was a, a scriptural, a, a biblical event. And the experiential event happened in about uh, 2000. Uh, uh, 20, about 2000, somewhere around there, uh, maybe a year or two before or after. And at that particular time, I was broke and I could not make my house payment. And I got several months behind. And finally, I got a courtesy call from the bank's lawyer. And she said, Tom, uh, we have to foreclose on you, but as a courtesy, I'll give you till Friday to get the money together where you can bring this current. And uh, and I'm thinking about the whole thing. I could sell this. No, no, we buy it. I, how about this? I could make some money over here. I could do this. I do that and this so forth. And I, and I thought, you know, if everything else fails, I'll ask my friend Gary. He's my backstop. I know he would help me. And as soon as I thought that, I said, oh my gosh, how can I trust a human being as my backstop? God, you are my backstop. Hmm. So I said, God, I'm going to trust you now to make to give me the money to provide for this. So Friday comes along and I don't hear anything. And I think, well, probably I'll hear something on Monday. Monday comes along, nothing. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a week, a month, <laughs> nothing. And uh, and it keeps going like this um, for 18 months. I hear nothing from the bank, and I haven't been able to make a payment for 18 months. Until finally, I have the money. 
about forty thousand dollars by this time mm, mm. in back payments. So I go to my lawyer and say, "Will you talk to the bank, and I'll make payment." And he goes and he comes back and says, "Well, they they find you one late payment." <laughs> yeah, what? That was it. And so I, I was able to make the payments, one late payment, and I was current. And and I thought how every single day, there was not a day I went by that I did not have to trust God to provide. And I think that's the walking by faith. And there's no performance in that. <laughs> no, no. You know? That, that's an amazing story. So God yeah. intervened behind the scenes. Yeah. And, and, and you don't know parents, how, but he did. He, he blinded their eyes. They did. They didn't care right. about you anymore. Right. I'm assuming <laughs> they didn't watch your house. <laughs> I'm assuming they lost it now. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the second event happened in about um, 2009, and I was going to a church, and the the assistant pastor was preaching because the it was during the summertime, so he was doing this series on the parable. And he was reading and, and studying about this parable in Luke 14, where Jesus is at a banquet and he observes everybody trying to jostle to get to the head table to the, get to the best seat. And he tells them a parable about that when you go to a banquet, take the seat farthest from the head table so that when the uh, master of the of the home sees you there he will say in front of everybody come sit up here with me and he'll say to the one sitting next to him you go take his seat and he quotes this god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble mm -hmm. you know and so he's he's saying the preacher now is preaching about humility and he's going on about don't do this and this is not humble and this is humble and and so forth and it's like Jesus sat next to me. He elbows me in the ribs and says, that's not what I meant. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, this was like very real to me. And I said, well, what did you mean? And he said, I'm not going to tell you. You figure it out. And so every day, I spent hours researching this. I talked to all kinds of scholars and read books and and thought about it and and so forth. And I had a paper due at Fuller, and I kind of <laughs> squeezed this subject into that paper uh, so that I could uh, legitimately take the time to research and have footnotes and so forth. And I came up with what the answer was, and the answer is that he was teaching about faith. Hmm. And faith is where we take and remove ourselves from a position and put our posi ourself in, in a place where only God can do it. And that's what happened on my home. And that's what the message was here. And that the second phase of that is that God does then put us in the right position. That mm -hmm. when we humble ourselves uh, and take that position farthest from the head table, by the kitchen door where it's noisy and drafty, then God can lift us up and put us in a place of honor. Tom, as I hear you speak and consider the lessons that God teaches you happen over long periods of time. There's no, yes. there, these are no quick fixes, no quick answers. You talk about 30 years, you talk about um, 18 months, you talk about, I don't know how long this uh, scriptural lesson was for you, several months, I guess. Months. Yeah, months, yeah. So, um, and that, see, that speaks to me too, in that we want God to act so quickly. We want our lives to change so quickly, but our hearts don't change until it goes 
Tilly goes really deep. And it's not just reading a verse and saying, I get it and moving on, but it is, um, it, it's absorbing, I guess, God's yes. word, absorbing the lessons he's teaching us, the the faith walk. As you as we talk about faith here, uh, the book that you've written, Let the Children Come, the life of George Mueller, and for those who don't know who George Mueller was, and uh, he, he was a great man of faith. I mean, when you speak of faith, uh, and you speak of Christian greats, uh, George Mueller was was one of those. Yeah. So uh, I started the book. I got it a few days ago. I said, I want to read this before I interview Tom. And I'm fascinated. I'm my Kindle says I'm 23 percent of the way into the book and I'm I'm gripped. I read a little bit every day. It's been it's been great. I, I love the book. I highly recommend it. But uh, I, why did you write this book? And there's something unique about this book that is uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, talking about time, it took me six years to write it, too. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and I received a, an email one day about a free ebook that I could download. And it was this uh, little book called Answers to Prayer, which was about George Muller. And I read this, and I had heard about George Muller when I went to Bible college, but I hadn't thought about him for. 40 years, probably. And for those of our listeners, Tom and I already had this uh, conversation. Is it Mueller? Is it Mueller? Is it Mueller? Uh, <laughs> it's German, so we probably got it all wrong. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to play with this for a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But you're the guest and the authority. You wrote the book, so we're going to go with Mueller. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you something interesting. When, I, when I've advertised on uh, Amazon, I get more people searching for George Mueller, M U E L L E R, mm -hmm. than, than Mueller. So uh, <laughs> you're probably more correct in what people recognize. I've just started to say Mueller a little bit more. Um, and uh, so I read this and I thought, this is really amazing. And I said, this story has got to be told to this brand new generation because this is a story of faith. And uh, so I started working on it kind of putting his life down. And there are biographies about him, autobiographies also, um, but they were, they're, they're, they're not very easy to read. How far uh, back are we going for his life? Uh, well, he was born in, in, uh, in uh, 1805. Okay. So he lived almost the entire uh, 19th century because he died in uh, 1898, I believe. Oh, okay. So, yeah, he 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 was there. So yeah, the, and now interesting too. Um, when he was born, there was no radio, steamship, telegram, anything like that. All this happened during his lifetime, which is an explosion of ideas. Uh, this was uh, Thomas Edison, uh, Nicholas Tesla, mm. you know, even uh, the Marconi. Exactly. Inventing radio, you radio. know. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know that. And um, so not very different from our time, really, with the explosion of the Internet and medicine and, and space travel and, and airlines and so forth. Um, and so. You know, he lived during that time, but we don't, we can't think of it that way. We we see that as old fashioned or that was for him, you know, but not for us. So finally, I decided, well, I've got to put this into a modern day. And so I worked on that, wasn't satisfied. So I went out and got some help and and um, shifted the the whole book around and made it to be future, uh, in the future, you know, uh, five years in the future. So I could get past the, the, uh, uh, the pandemic and also, mm. uh, deal with how orphans came here through the, uh, program of the immigration and whatnot, you know, so, uh, it, it helped solve some problems that way. And, uh, uh, so just, kept working on it and working on it. Finally, I figured, I, I think I've got it done now, you know, so. You published it just a few months ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's, it's George Mueller, George Mueller, uh, 
in the 21st century. Yeah. And, you know, George, George Muller, 200 years beyond when he lived. And uh, so you told his story, his auto, his biography. Uh, it's it's uh, it's fiction, but it's it's based, like they say, based on a true story. Uh, <laughs> so the, the events that happened in his life, let me just ask you one of them, which was a big one. When George came to Christ, his father disowned him. Did that yeah. happen in his his it life? It did. Yeah. It, it was a, as I, as I read that in your book, it's like, oh man, his father just said, uh, no, there will be no money in your bank account tomorrow and you need to leave. And George packed up that, that night and left and was, yeah. and found some other believers to stay with those who led him to Christ. And so yeah. that is, that's what happened in his life 200 years ago. And here we are now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So modern setting. Right. Right. Um, I, I changed his conversion a little bit. Um, Beta, uh, who was uh, involved with him in his conversion, uh, was the real was also a real Beta uh, back in that day, and uh, uh, Beta brought him to a home Bible study, and in the home Bible study, uh, it was illegal for anybody other than a clergy to teach the scripture. Mm. <laughs> Wow. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And so what they did is they got uh, copies of pastors' sermons, and they read them, wow. and that was their Bible study. And um, they they sang some songs, and then they prayed. And that's not unlike a small group Bible study right. that we have now. You know, very similar. With him back there, uh, he gravitated to this very quickly. Um, it, it just struck a chord with him uh, very early on when he went to the study. Hmm. Uh, in my book, I, I stretch it out a little bit. I make him more inquiring because I think today our society is a little bit more dubious of things and we, we doubt and we want to research and find out things so i i i I made that adaption to his conversion well he still came to christ really quickly i mean as i'm reading through this this is wonderful and uh, it was neat to read knowing that as i was reading it and hadn't talked to you having talked to you before that based on his true story that i bet you this is how it progressed when he was when he was around um, so that's good. I would highly recommend this for our listeners to go ahead and get the book. I'll put a link in my show notes for that. The Let the Children Come, The Life of George Muller. Uh, and so I, I want to, it is a book of faith. I mean, I'm really excited because you're about ready to unpack this even more at the 23% mark in the book. <laughs> and I get, <laughs> I get into that more, but there's an, there's another part to the, how this book has blossomed and this is pretty exciting too. Our listeners would love to hear this. I'll let you tell that story. <laughs> yeah. Now this is an amazing story too, you know. Uh, but I gave my no, I didn't give it. I told my friend, one of my best friends, I said, uh, Gary, in fact, the same Gary that I thought would could be my backstop. I said, <laughs> Gary. So now uh, you really needed him. <laughs> yeah, you went to uh, him this time, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I said, Hey, uh, here I read this book. I wrote this book. So he bought it, he read it. And he calls up his son. He says, Garrett, you've got to read this book. So he reads it. And his son is a Hollywood actor and producer. He reads it and says, oh, my gosh, this is absolutely amazing. And so he gives it to uh, <clears throat> another older producer friend of his. And he reads it. He says, oh, my gosh, what a story here. <laughs> So they optioned the book to make a movie out of it. My gosh. And uh, so then they raise some development funds and they hire a script writer. And uh, this particular script writer uh, has a best friend who's also a director. And the director and the other producer and the screenplay writer were the three principal people that made the movie Soul Surfer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very successful movie. So 
they're going to write th this book. They're, this is the team to put this, uh, this book out or to make this movie from the book. Wow. So after about six weeks, um, the screenplay writer talks to Garrett and he says, Garrett, I need to talk to Tom Faye. I said, okay. So we arranged a Zoom meeting and uh, his name is Howie. And, and Howie says, Tom, I'm actually writing two screenplays and you decide which one you want. And then I'm kidding me. Oh my, wow. He says, he says, the first one is true to your book. And he says, there will be a, an audience for that. Um, the second one is inspired by your book. <laughs> and, and he says, that's going to be a huge audience. And we talked about how do we keep the same element of faith in the big audience <laughs> movie, you know, and, um, and so we had this good talk and I said, let's go with the one that's going to reach more people. Mm -hmm. And so he, he said at the close, he says, Tom, I really enjoyed talking with you. Let's talk next week, too. So I said, OK, well, we've talked every week for almost two years now. Wow. <laughs> we become best friends. There you go. Here. You uh, you became a pastor again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the screenplay has just turned out to be awesome. So this and, again. So this has been a two-year event just to get to the screenplay from the first meetings. That's right. Oh, That's you right. have a lot of patience, Tom, a lot of patience. <laughs> uh, and so when, <laughs> don't tell me the movie will be out in 10 years. <laughs> Is it going to be sooner than that? <laughs> well, they're hoping it'll be a Christmas release. Okay. Christmas season. That's probably after Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving on. Okay. Okay. Um, I wanted our, our listeners to hear about this and uh, it's pretty cool. And you could be praying for this and the ministry that could happen to this and people coming to faith in Christ. How does your faith walk these days different than say it was two, three, 10 years ago? I think just trusting God more, you know, I think we have to, I think that's what, um, that's what faith really should do. So trusting God should become stronger as we get older, you know, and, and frequently it is. In fact, that was one of George Muller's complaints was he said, I see older people who trust God less, you know, mm. and uh, that he said that shouldn't be. And, uh, and of course, <laughs> very few people trusted him like George did, but there were many people who trusted George just like George did. Maybe not the magnitude, but there were people that trusted him almost in that same magnitude. Um, uh, there was uh, Hudson Taylor who, who followed in that same footsteps and did unbelievable ministry in China, you know, and um, just many, many others, you know, who followed in that footsteps. I think we need faith heroes. I mean, my faith hero is uh, Dr. Bill Bright of oh, okay. uh, Campus Crusade. And I had the chance to serve with him for a few years and just watch him in real life. He talked about faith and he walked by faith and it really felt like it rubbed off on me. Yeah. Would you say that George Mueller is one of your faith heroes then? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to know, I want to keep learning more about him and, and so forth. Um, he was an extremely intelligent man. He spoke about, uh, I think it was eight languages. Gee. And uh, he also traveled the world. He, he spoke in 42 different nations uh, he he was accepted into uh, the top political realms. The President of the United States had him come in, Queen of England, the Tsar of Russia. He was very well received. And when he spoke in all these different uh, cities around the world, thousands of people came to hear him speak. And his wife, who traveled with him, his second wife, his first wife had died, his second wife, uh, chronicalized all that in a book. Mm. And so we, she said he spoke here and so many people attended and, and so on. So we really know what happened, you know. And um, As you experience faith more deeply, Tom, and, and more clearly, do you still wrestle with performing for Christ? Does that 
never come back to you or have you been able to get through that? I think I got through that. Yeah. Um, you really can't ever perform well enough for God. <laughs> you know, uh, um, it, we forget about a little verse in Hebrews. Uh, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hmm. Think about that, you know. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. That means that anything else you're doing doesn't please him. And in fact, uh, doesn't he say that in one of the passages about sacrifices and burnt offerings that I don't need or want or something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it is faith that pleases him. Well, that's what it looks like to walk by faith long term. It's a key element in pushing away performance Christianity. And Tom has been able to do that. And, you know, I can't wait to see the movie at the end of the year. It's going to be good. I, I, I read the book. I encourage you to read it as well, as I already said. Hey, um, if you want your life to be vibrant, uh, a consistent walk of faith, then I want to help you. Fresh Faith 24-7 is open. It's ready for you to take it for a test drive. Yep, a free trial that'll get you inside and experience all the great benefits. I want to tell you about one element that I think is really, really at the core, and that is the Freedom Path training inside Fresh Faith 24-7. It's truly focused on those who are struggling with performance Christianity. If that's you, then, hey, I created this for you. I call it the Freedom Path Training. It's a four-module video training that puts you on the path to freedom, just like the title said, right at the core of Fresh Faith 24-7. Now, it comes with a playbook, so you can follow along with the videos. You can take notes. You can do the assignments. We, it's, you're not just going to watch this thing go, oh, that's nice. No, follow through and take notes. Have some victory, okay? This content, if you really use the playbook that goes with it, will go from your head to your heart, to your life. Escape performance. Embrace Christ. Move from spiritual dryness to joy, peace, and fulfillment. Your relationship with Christ will be fresh again. So four modules. Uh, there's a total of 28 sessions in here. Module number one, I start off with the awakening. Module two is the core. Module three is the depth. And module four is the follow through. Now, if you want to take advantage of this, if you're saying, now nah, I need to get into, I need to get into Freedom Path training right now, then go in. Got a free trial going on at freshfaith247.com. Just click on free trial. You get in and your membership starts right away and use all the resources, especially the Freedom Path training. Start there, please. Start there. If you're wondering, how do I get going in this thing? What do I do once I get in? Start with the Freedom Path training. I even have an intro video in that. So in the awakening, that first module, when you get in, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about my story of 50 years ago and to today. No, I tell it really quickly. And your story. My story, your story. You'll learn about an important concept is what I call the above-below principle, the above-slash-below principle. I believe understanding this principle will turn your life around from performance to relationship. I'm that strong about that. Uh, then we'll do some stone clearing, and I'll lead you through an exercise that'll help you break free from performance Christianity. We'll even go deeper. We'll study relationship. What's that all about? And we'll study covenant. That's an interesting concept, and we can learn a lot from Scripture about covenant, and that will help you in this breakthrough from performance to relationship. So that's just module one, the awakening and the three after that, the core, the depth, the follow through. Uh, get started in the Freedom Path training. Would you do that? Uh, I do believe it's life changing. Uh, you go at your own speed because God has us all going at different paces. Um, I am the instructor in each of the videos. You'll really get to know me after you're done with it. But go eat it up, go deep with Jesus. In the midst of all that, uh, I have interviews with believers who are experiencing freedom in their relationship with Christ, just so I, like I do on this podcast. And so you'll meet some of my friends there. Uh, and and that, there it is. That's the Freedom Path training. That's just one of the benefits, one of the resources inside 
Fresh Faith 24-7. So try it out. Take it for a test drive with the free trial at FreshFaith247.com. Next episode, again, it's about knowing Christ. So we're going to talk about how knowing Jesus brings our spirit to life. Until then, take the assessment and get in to Fresh Faith 24-7. God bless.